I'd say, yeah, my project's going really well, but it's kind of top secret. I can't say too much about it, but it's oh. nice to be doing music again. Really oh, nice. it's top secret music project. That sounds yes. intriguing. It is. I want to I ask you a bunch of leading questions. So yeah. <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it a situation where there is like, there are lyrics or is it just instrumental? There are lyrics, but Ooh. I'm not singing. Oh, I was hoping I got to hear Conrad sing finally. <laughs> oh, I'm doing backing vocals, thinking about oh. it, but very much in a sort of Monty Python men's choir style. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that so is it? Am I to assume that it's comedic instead of like goth synth? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's very comedic. So lovely. It'll end up on YouTube, I'll say that much. So, Do you know when? Um, I don't, actually. A few weeks, I should think, as things okay. stand. But I'll keep everyone posted. But that's one of my projects. Have you got any fun projects underway at the moment? Well, I've got ideas for projects. So I have, as, every, as many people know, I've been working on this Doctor Who scarf. I kind of took a little break from it as I am want to do, which is not great. But anyway, when I finish that, which hopefully will go pretty quickly, I'm trying to figure out like that our topic for today kind of made me wonder about like what kinds of yarns I would need to be <laughs> getting for my next knitting project. I have a couple <laughs> of ideas and I wanted to run them by you. I have some pictures. Oh, great. <laughs> so, okay. I just wanted to, to sort of see. So one idea is sort of Harry Potter related. So like an owl cardigan that's inspired by Jenny's sort of sweater. Um, you can't knit a sweater for like your significant other or you doom the relationship to being to, to ending. That is a knitter's knowledge thing that I will share. With really? You. Oh, absolutely. There's it's the wow. sweater curse. There's a sweater okay. curse. And if you give like you like. You can give a, a person a scarf as a gift, but if you make someone a sweater, by the time you get done knitting the sweater, the relationship will be over. Wow. Okay. I will look out for that one. <laughs> okay. And then the other one, so Harry Potter theme, or I'm leaning toward the second option, which is I do a lot of scarves, but like a Lord of the Rings scarf, either elf elfy or possibly... Uh, Riders of Rohan, which are like my favorite. I love Rohan and like the horses and all of that from Lord of the Rings. So I would love to come up with some sort of really cool, almost Celtic-y looking, you know, either trees or horses like knitted into something. So what do you, what would you lean toward more? I would probably lean towards the latter just yeah. because for a couple of reasons one it's sort of stylistically more interesting and challenging yeah. but also even though that was the unofficial knits i'd still be worried about somehow contributing towards jk rowling <laughs> and her riches that's fair which i don't want to do right now oh well, sure mostly i really <laughs> like that particular sweater which i don't know if, it, if it's ever worn in any of the films but it's got this cool owl knit thing on the back which is really interesting and it kind of looks challenging and i love challenges when i'm knitting so really see i i wouldn't but <laughs> <laughs> i always want to push myself to learn a new skill so okay yeah so anyway welcome to dreamland everyone my name is melinda yes. and my name uh, is conrad and yes or canrod if if you <laughs> <laughs> like to read the uh, screen but yeah so today um our topic is um yarns uh mm. yarns is sort of the the watch word so to speak and uh we had some people online uh guess what the topic was actually going to be about and i have a few of the top guesses here so the first one it, it comes from jason anderson who says melinda and conrad take us on a tour of 80s joanne fabrics and get lost in the pattern section for a while Ooh. that sounds delightful did joanne fabrics exist in the 80s i don't even know you guys don't have them over there do you no it's not a brand that uh, uh leaps out at me so you do know. you have any big box sewing and fabric stores there that you're aware of not anymore no if oh. there were they're all gone oh that's no. sad no it's all child labor in southeast <laughs> asia now <laughs> God, that's terrible. i 
no. <laughs> it's true. Uh, yes. Uh, Philip Story says, urban legends. Ooh, that's a nice idea. That's a really fun idea, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, Salvador says, I don't know, my mom used to have these contraptions that were like baby doll heads with yarn bodies or dresses. That's probably a stretch, though. It, yeah, but it's dark enough for us, though. It is. <laughs> it's sort of reminiscent of the Cabbage Patch Kid thing, I think. The lady yes. who actually invented the, I think she called them little little people, if memory serves. And uh, <laughs> they were made with, like, I think stockings, but then they, they anyway, it was this weird fabric sculpture process uh and then jasmine schaefer says i have suspected since the title was announced as have a few other here that yarns will mean stories i am thinking it will be the anthology series of the 80s such as amazing stories tales from the crypt the hitchhiker the 80s revival of alfred hitchcock presents tales from the dark side monsters freddy's nightmares etc that's a good one that's i'd like to do really that good guess isn't it it's a fabulous guess. It's very close. It's so close. I think Jasmine got the closest of anyone, but no one guessed it. No. Which either means that we did a great job of like making people not know what we're talking about, or no one has any idea what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> like no one's ever heard of these things, and we're going to be... <laughs> or we've picked a really weird topic. That's one thing. It's it's obscure. So maybe it's a combo platter, but we're gonna find out. Um, our actual topic this week is fairy tale TV shows of the '80s. So mm. um, we have a couple, like much like last time, we we each picked. I picked an American series. Conrad picked a British series, and we will be sort of going into that. But since we're talking fairy tales, like what do you have memories of fairy tales like being told to you as a kid or what was your first awareness of them like so my first awareness of fairy tales actually was an irreverent version of fairy tales which is roald dahl's revolting rhymes <laughs> which uh, t took them all and gave them a sort of ghastly spin that it would always end up with something really awful and gruesome happening to children which, I don't know, I, you might not know this about me, but I'm actually sort of sick and twisted and really like that sort of thing. <laughs> I, I have noticed that about you. I yeah, love it. Uh, and one of my particular favourites was his version of Little Red Riding Hood, where mm. I, I always remember it. It's um, She's in a face-off with the wolf and it says something about her eyelid flickers and she whips a pistol from her knickers. <laughs> Um, and she shoots, she shoots the wolf and ends up in a nice wolfskin coat. So that was, that was probably one of the first books I ever bought was a Roald Dahl book with these disgusting fairy tale stories uh, in and, them and Quentin Blake illustrations. How old were you at this point? I was definitely still single digits. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> my parents were transgressive <laughs> <laughs> um well i know for me uh well i had several different um things that that were like related to that so um i'll talk about one of them in a minute but um i know i definitely loved fairy tales from like early early on like obviously there was probably some storybook that had tons of fairy tales in it um and um sorry trying to fix my camera here you've got a lovely gauzy soft focus going on right now. i mean it's fine i could keep doing <laughs> that but um but but yeah i'm gonna get into i have a couple of examples i'm gonna actually show you like i still have some of the books that i had as a kid but i definitely as a girl was constantly being told fairy tales but a lot of the ones that i heard were like twisted and dark as well maybe not in the comedic way mine were more like you know edgar Allan poe level of gothic tragedy which messed me up in a totally different way <laughs> right okay <laughs> but but we're still very on brand here 100 <laughs> percent. like we're just nailing it all the way down um <laughs> so um i'm gonna start off with just a little bit of history but it won't be painful so um the history of the fairy tale is very difficult to trace uh, because it's while only the written accounts 
of the, the historical versions survive, many of the ones we know are actually prehistoric, meaning pre-written word. Um, and they, they go back like they've been passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years orally. So um, according to a lot of researchers, um, many fairy tales date back thousands of years, some to the Bronze Age. Uh, and a Durham University anthropologist, Dr. Jamie Tarani, said that Jack and the Beanstalk was rooted in a group of stories classified as the boy who stole ogre's treasure and could be traced back to when Eastern and Western Indo-European languages split more than 5,000 years ago. Now, this this was sort of ascertained because they used a lot of the same methods they use for like genetic branching and like mapping back like you know what species of animals come from other species of animals so they use the same thing in terms of like folk tales and, and things that they find in all these different cultures uh and so this starts getting into my whole anthropology background so as i was studying this 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 month i have completely fallen down the rabbit hole and i was just like <laughs> just voraciously reading this stuff it's it's absolutely fascinating to me um, it also showed that uh, Beauty and the Beast and Rumpelstiltskin, Rumpelstiltskin are about 4,000 years old, which I was wow. shocked to hear that. Um, and then folklorists have these very weird um, cl classification systems. Um, the main one that people know of is the Arn Thompson Uther classification system. That's quite a mouthful. Um, and of the more and the morphological analysis of Vladimir Prop. Uh, so basically what these are is they group different stories and, and myths throughout different cultures based on the general story thing. So for example, animal stories, and then underneath animal stories, you have things like wild animals and domestic animals, wild animals and humans, domestic animals, other animals and objects. So, and they get numbers. So it's kind of like for those of you who are old enough to remember card catalogs, it's very much like the Dewey Decimal System card catalog thing, but for fairy tales. Yeah. Um, lots of scholars have interpreted the tales and their importance, but there's no consensus about their meaning. So when we start talking about like real fairy tale stuff, you get to the big three. And I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, but we've got Charles Perrault. I can't say it right because I'm not French, but basically <laughs> he he wrote things like Sleeping Beauty, Little Red Riding Hood and Cinderella. And he may not have written them because a lot of these people are gathering these stories from local people and just writing them down so that they are recorded. But he was notable for adding a moral at the beginning of the tale. And I won't take the time to read what he writes here about Sleeping Beauty, but it basically says that young women, if they are chased, should should wait for the right man to come along. Um, and that's what Sleeping Beauty is about. Uh, and then the next one, of course, is the Brothers Grimm. Uh, they're among the best known storytellers of folk tales, and they have stories like Cinderella, the Frog Prince, Hansel and Gretel, Rapunzel, etc. Um, and they ultimately began stripping out a lot of the lewd stuff because these stories were very adults. They were not for children. They had lots of sex and violence. Um, the Grimm brothers really enjoyed the violent stuff, so they kind of dial that up, but then they pull out a lot of the sex stuff and some of what they consider to be inappropriate, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, to make them more suitable for children, which means very kids love violence, but they're not really <laughs> prepared for the sex stuff. So basically, they had the same mentality as my parents. Um <laughs> This artwork that I have here on the slide is by Arthur Rack Rackham uh, from 1917 from a story called The Gnomes, and it's really gorgeous. And a lot of these stories were illustrated so that they could be, you know, read to children and shown to them. So, um, and then the third one, which a lot of people are also familiar with, is Hans Christian Andersen, who um, is from Denmark, and uh, he both retold stories and wrote some of his own. So he wrote things like The Princess and the Pea, Thumbelina, The Little Mermaid, The Ugly Duckling. And a lot of his stuff focuses on being really, really bleak and focus on transformation. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> Might have been driven by his own personal circumstances, I suspect. <laughs> Absolutely. He's got a very fascinating life. And I actually really love his stories. I didn't realize how awesome they were until I started delving into this. Um, and then, of course, Disney comes in and throughout the years, they've done tons of different fairy tales and they've given us like what, what are probably now like 
the ones that all of us know, the versions of these stories that we all know, but most of them have much older, much darker, crazier versions that um, we're going to somewhat talk about today. But anyway, just obviously we all think of Disney when we think of fairy tales these days, I think. Um, so a lot of uh, 80s kids had um, lots of anthology choices, including they had like fairy tale books like this from Eric Kincaid. Um, and then I have like an example here of uh, what I had as a kid, which was child craft books um, made by the, the World Book Encyclopedia folks. And so they would have things like, let me, let me make it so you can actually see. Um, there we go. Um, beautifully illustrated Rapunzel story. And then um, my dad also loved to show me things like uh, Edgar Allan Poe, um, which, you know, you can see this is the actual book that my dad read to me uh, nighttime bedtime stories out of uh, the telltale heart being dog eared because it was one of the favorites that he loved to read to me as a seven year old. So anyway, <laughs> nice. That's great. Um, I think that I actually learned, I think that the telltale heart has a lot of similarity to a really archaic grim story called the juniper tree, which is one of the most messed up, fairy tale stories I have ever read in my entire life. And if you haven't read it or heard anything about it, you should check it out because if you like really twisted stuff, oh my God. Anyway, I'm just leaving <laughs> that there with you. Um, all right. So, um, so coming up to um, what my, my story is going to be about today, which is fairy tale theater. Um, so in 1980 uh, on the set of Popeye, uh, with Robin Williams, Shelley Duvall was reading The Frog Prince as she waited for her uh, scene, her next scene to be filmed. And she'd wanted to do a live action fairy tale show for a lot of years. And so just two years later, um, the, her dream became a reality. And the product was fairy tale theater, and it was produced over a five year span from 1982 to 1987. Um, Shelley is the host and sometimes a participant to the dramatic recreations. The approach of the show is kind of like Shrek in a way, in the sense that there was a lot of adult references uh, in, and satire that went way over kids' heads, but it made it pretty entertaining for the whole family. So adults could watch it and kids could watch it and get something out of it. Um, and they made, they made it on Showtime. So it was sort of a cable show, which allowed them to kind of be a little edgier sometimes. And for the most part, the tone was pretty comedic, but weirdly didn't stray a whole lot from some of the earlier versions that the Grimm's brothers put out. Um, so I have a little clip of uh, Shelley Duvall's intro, which is always fun. Every single time she opens in a different costume and stuff, but with the same concept. Hello. I'm Shelley Duvall. Join us for tonight's tale about the adventures of a little radish who learns the many lessons of love. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I can't help it. Whenever I hear Shelley Duvall's voice, I just hear her screaming and trying to get away from Jack Nicholson. <laughs> Is that just me? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, there's something about her that's, she's just a little off. Like, <laughs> Not in a bad way. I mean that in a totally complimentary way. But like she's her voice sounds so sweet. But then she's like, you also kind of feel like she might just pull out a dagger and stab you. Like, <laughs> she's, I don't know. She's a little scary to me. <laughs> um, so Shelley Duvall actually managed to secure some really um, big names, some sought after actors of the time, including... Uh, people like Robin Williams, who was in the very first episode as the Frog Prince. You've got Jeff Goldblum as the Big Bad Wolf in The Three Little Pigs. Leonard Nimoy uh, in Aladdin. Uh, Christopher Reeve at, in Sleeping Beauty. Um, James Earl Jones in Aladdin as well. Uh, of course, Paul Rubens, who was Pee Wee Herman as Pinocchio. He made a perfect Pinocchio. And my favorite episode was the one with Carrie Fisher and William Catt, uh, which was Thumbelina, which again is a Hans Christian Andersen story. Um, but I think that episode is probably one of the saddest, most straight, they play it straight in that one. And it's kind of sad and goth, whereas most of them are a little bit wacky and comedic. Um, right. And then she also got some pretty big directors from the time. So things like Francis, oh, sorry, this is, there was one other person she got. So Mick Jagger, 
did this really weird like <laughs> it's it's like he plays this uh asian character i guess oh, chinese dear. character um the story is not chinese in origin i think it's also a hans christian anderson story if i'm not mistaken it's called the nightingale but it's about an emperor in china but they cast Mick Jagger and the only Asians in the cast are like supporting characters. So they did cast Asian characters, but not in the lead roles. It's just very odd. Yeah. That wouldn't happen now. <laughs> <laughs> one would, one would think not probably. One would hope not. <laughs> but the look that he has on his face here is pretty much the look he has throughout. Um, <laughs> Why does he look like Harry Styles? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> looks so pouty. Anyway, um, we got some great directors as well, including Francis Ford Coppola, who directed an episode on Rip Van Winkle. Tim Burton did a really great Aladdin. And Nicholas Meyer did one about the Pied Piper of Hamelin, which was all in verse. Like, it was all like a poem. All the verses rhymed. It was a little odd, but... Oh. Um, so, so, yeah, there was a lot of interesting stuff in there. The show's pretty noteworthy in that it kind of poked fun at the original story a little bit and and it almost broke the fourth wall sometimes in, in its in its commentary on plot decisions that the character makes and things like that so like here i'm going to show a clip of uh cinderella's fairy godmother who really has to push her to think of a suitable object for her to use to turn into a coach so this is from cinderella something round A vegetable. We have some pumpkins growing in the garden. Pumpkin? Yes, that's good. Oh. Well, now, come on. Let's go find a pumpkin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Cinderella's really slow on the uptake. <laughs> <laughs> she may be pretty, but she's not the brightest bulb <laughs> in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> um uh sometimes the 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 depictions of these things were really terrifying and um uh, this one from rapunzel really <laughs> it really terrified me as a kid um there's it's so weird because uh sh the mom in this story of course this is rapunzel's mom she's pregnant and she's craving she's having food cravings but she's having this nightmare about these radishes and they kind of come to life in this horrific way and she's dreaming about them so just check this out and listen to the music because the music score behind this is just phenomenal <laughs> It's a literal nightmare fuel. <laughs> Good grief. I remember seeing that as a kid and just being like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because the radishes are like cannibals too. So it's just really disturbing. Yeah, it's like this radish puppet that has giant teeth and it's also eating other radishes. And it's yeah. very terrifying looking. And, and what she does is she wakes up and she's like, honey, I'm hungry. I need some radishes. And I'm like, that would not be my response to this situation. But okay. No. Um, th this is also, so Shelley Duvall in that particular episode, which is Rapunzel, plays the mom of Rapunzel as well as playing Rapunzel later when she's grown. And so when she's in bed and she's thinking of like what she wants the first time around, she comes up with this idea and she tells her husband, I really want these rapunz, which is a word, an archaic word that is a type of radish. And um, oh. so here is her telling her husband, Jeff Bridges, who weirdly also plays Prince Charming later in the story as well. Um, yeah, serious daddy issues, Rapunzel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Uh, she's telling him what she wants. And his response is one of the examples of how the subtext kind of goes over children's heads, I think. 
Oh, God, I've got to have a radish. I'd give anything for a taste of one right now. Sure you wouldn't like a nice cucumber? Mm -hmm. Get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> um and I didn't pull these clips but there's a there's a clip in the uh the very first episode of this show was The Frog Prince where Robin Williams initially plays a frog um and he's wearing this horrendous outfit that's very form fitting and you can see a lot more than you probably need to and Terry Gar plays the haughty snotty princess and um at, at a point, uh, he tells her towards the beginning that he really wants to sleep with her. And it's sort of like this wink, wink, nudge, nudge thing. And this is when he's a frog. And then, you know, later when the frog, she's got him in her bedroom, he says, well, you're very beautiful in your own bitchy way. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, that's a good choice for a children's TV show. And then um, she kisses him and then he turns into a nude hum human male in her bed alone in the room with her, which during this time, of course, isn't going to go over well, but um, it's really Robin Williams fully nude with just a red cloth. Uh, this this image here is when he first changes from a frog, so he's still small, and then they just make him grow uh, in the bed, and it's very upsetting to watch. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is, and you get, you can, he is definitely nude. Uh -huh. He is definitely nude. Uh -huh. And I, I'm, I'm sure that this is probably pre the time when they had those special modesty socks that oh, they yeah. used no. for actors in this situation. No, he's just nude with Terry Gar on a children's TV show. Yeah. Painted green initially. Yeah, it's it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's very upsetting. Um, and then the other interesting thing I wanted to point out is uh, that... Uh, Tim Burton's Tim Burton's Aladdin episode is pretty impressive and you can really see his style was already really formed like when he goes in to get the lamp out of the cave and the story does stick pretty closely to one of the earliest versions that we have there's there are two genies in the original story one's a genie of the ring and what the other is a genie of the lamp and so when he goes to obtain the lamp from this cave there's this very it, it's very reminiscent of Beetlejuice to me um, and you can see it in the lower left corner here where it's sort of like this big open mouth looking creature with a hand sticking out of its mouth. And that hand was holding the uh, the lamp. So uh, Val Valerie Bertinelli is, you know, the, the princess in this um, kind of weird casting choices again in terms of like, you know, whitewashing some of these characters. But I mean... It was the 80s, so no one's really terribly surprised. But the, the artwork in this episode is really unique and interesting. So, Yeah. I did not realize that Tim Burton touched an episode of this. It's pretty amazing, the lineup. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, honestly, that episode is pretty solid. Um, I have several that I think are fun to watch, but that one is definitely a standout. Yeah. Well, that show did not make it to British Shores at all, as far as I'm aware. Where was it broadcast in the US? On Showtime. Right, okay. It it just didn't make it over here. I've, I've never seen it before, so this was quite the <laughs> cultural exchange and, and the right. journey of discovery, watching nightmarish radishes and nude Robin Williams. <laughs> You're welcome, Conrad. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You'll never recover. So the show, the show I picked which uh, is, I, it's kind of cheating to say it's a UK production. It was produced in the UK and there are there's a lot of British talent involved, but it's headlined by a very, very, very uh, American uh, man. It is Jim Henson's The Storyteller, mm. which came out in 1987. Now, the genesis of this was uh, Jim Henson's eldest daughter, uh, Lisa Henson, who majored in folklore and mythology and Harvard and pitched the idea of an anthology show to her father after seeing Shelley Duvall's show and wanting to see more of the lesser known tales adapted, the ones that, that she had learned about. Um, so uh, to, 
to quote her, she said, fairy tale theatre had the very famous fairy tales done very comedically and full of stars and just played on the fact that you knew the story. Having read so much folklore and knowing there was so much rich material, I thought we should expose some of these other fairy tales to the public. So it was pitched very much during Henson's gothic fantasy phase when he'd set up in the UK and he uh -huh. was working on things like The Dark Crystal in 82 and Labyrinth in 86 uh, from a time when Henson had set up his creature workshop in London. Um, mm. That's what it used to look like in the 80s right <laughs> up until the early 2000s and then now it's an apartment building called The Henson. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Sad uh, progress, isn't it? But yeah, yeah they're gone well, now. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like uber modern slapped on top of a lovely old building. Yeah. And probably costs an absolute fortune. But there uh, we go. Yeah. <laughs> sign of the times, right? <laughs> Indeed. So the format of the show is it has a storyteller. Um, the host is. John Hurt in it and the the sort of um the the overarching format of the show has him telling stories to his trusty dog by the fireplace um and the dog is of course a puppet uh which is voiced by uh Brian Henson mm -hmm. and they very much wanted to incorporate the figure of the storyteller to oral to honour the oral tradition of the stories and focus on the language which visually evokes sort of metaphors and, and poetry in the material, made it really rich and beautiful. Um, so I have a question. Hmm. Why do you think that they decided to put prosthetics on John Hurt? Like, it seems like a weird choice, but maybe it's just because it makes it go along with the, the puppets and stuff. Is that sort of the idea? I think so, yes, and also to make him look older because he was still a relatively young man at the time. This isn't long after Alien, so right, yeah. Right. So okay. they're they're slapping loads of stuff on him to make him look like a a wise old geezer sitting by the fireplace. Mm -hmm. um, all of the shows were scripted by Anthony Minghella, uh, who would end up being an Oscar-nominated writer director of The English Patient, Talented Mr. Ripley, Cold Mountain. Uh, he started out, life oddly enough, thinking about connections to previous Dreamland episodes. He started out working on Grange Hill with Phil Redmond. You know, and, that uh, is the second tie-in to a previous Dreamland, at least, because we had Nicholas Meyer, who wrote, mm -hmm. you know, who directed The Day After, yes. in our Nuclear Nightmares episode, was a director for the the Pied Piper of Hamlin a minute ago so right yeah it's all connected <laughs> it's all connected yeah there's a knock at my door if you could vamp for me for a second I sure can <laughs> um so let me see what's next on Conrad's list of things so um yeah so the show was very special to him his brother says hedgehog was his password for everything so <laughs> <laughs> I I love that. I kind yes, of want he, my hedgehog, like want my password to be hedgehog now too. Indeed, yeah. He revealed that after, sadly, Anthony Mangella passed at a very, very young, uh, young age, comparatively fifty-four. So, yeah, he was taken from us too soon. Very talented guy, and his scripts for the storyteller are beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's it's the the language is really rich. Yes, uh, not surprisingly. It won the BAFTA Awards for Best Children's Programme at a time when there were only two awards for children's TV. And the production value on it was really high. I mean, it's it's quite cinematic. It was shot on film, although it was like the Star Trek TNG. All the effects were done on video, composited on video. But it was shot on film, and it, it has a very filmic look. Um, Steve Barron directed three episodes, Henson directed two himself, uh, John Amiel, who directed Copycat, the serial killer thriller, mm -hmm. he directed one. And I think Steve Barron really sort of set the visual style of the show in his first episodes, which uh, he focused very much on blurring 
the mm -hmm. between the world of the storyteller telling the story with his dog and the real world and there were all these very clever transitions from the na the narration bits and the storytelling bits and visually there were lots of things that were using sort of silhouettes um and so on sort of shadow play that would show up in the set um and it, it was very much tied in with Steve Barron's experience working as a director of music videos, particularly one that he was famous for was uh, Take On Me for Aha, the animated one. Love that. Um, Love it. Yeah. He went on to direct the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, and he's still directing now. He recently did the Around the World in 80 Days series with mm. former Doctor Who David Tennant, which was brilliant if, if you haven't seen it. But yeah very beautiful nice. but yeah there's some examples there you can't see them very clearly of the transitions and crossovers so you'll have things like there'll be a character that's sitting by a lake dipping their toes in the water and you'll cut to a wide shot and they'll be in the dog's bowl by the fireplace sitting on the brim of the dog bowl or you'll see the sort of shadow play as part of a painting behind the storyteller in the storyteller's room yes so, yes beautifully done um it also features pr probably not as star studied as a star studied as fairy tale theatre. It featured a number of prominent UK actors or ones that became prominent afterwards. So there's a very young Bob Peck in The Soldier and Death. Uh, mm. You'll probably know him for saying clever girl in <laughs> Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, the comedy duo Jennifer Saunders and Dawn French appear as the ugly <gasps> sisters in Sap Sorrow. I did not even catch that. Did you not? I did yes. not. Oh yeah, my God. Are. I feel so stupid now that I, I see it completely now. Yeah, wow. That's go. amazing. <laughs> I, my mind is blown. They're great in it. Um, you've got Miranda Richardson and Jolie Richardson, no relation, <laughs> and Jonathan Price in the very scary episode, The Three Ravens. Mm -hmm. um, you, you'll not be surprised here, Miranda Richardson's evil. Um, she does you also, so well. <laughs> she's brilliant at evil, Miranda. Uh, you also have a really shockingly young Sean Bean in The True Bride. He doesn't die. Spoilers. He doesn't. Bit of, bit of a shocker for Sean Bean. And uh, James Wilby, who was in Howard's End and other Merchant Ivory movies like Morris. Uh, he's in Sap Sorrow as sort of the Prince Charming figure. Yeah, Sap but Sorrow being sort of a Cinderella type story. It is. It's in that same yeah. archetype, um, just in case for those of you who may not know. Yeah, it it would be in that sort of in the categorization system. It would be sat in the same sort of vein for sure. Yeah. Um, but really the heroes of the show were the Muppets not surprisingly for a Henson show my personal favorite and the one that stuck with me I can't show clips because I'm fairly sure we'd get copyright struck immediately yeah but my favorite was in the soldier and death there is a whole horde of little winged devils that the soldier plays <laughs> cards I love with them. I don't and even like puppets and I like those they are so good. They've got these really beautifully articulated mouths. It, they use the show very much as a test bed for lots of different technologies that they were trialing with puppets and did some amazing work. These little guys are so funny. <laughs> I love that they have little earrings. And one of the things I noticed, because I think I told you this, Conrad, when, when I was watching it, I saw it on one of the streaming services. I think it's on um, Shout Factory. Um oh. And so I, I was watching it with subtitles because I always watch everything because I have a hearing loss. And on the subtitles, I think I sent you a screen grab where it was like each one of the little devils had a name. So it would say like as an identifier of who was speaking, it would say like Devil Mike, Devil Richard, <laughs> Devil Lucas, you know, like whatever. And it was just so funny to think that. These little guys have just regular names like Jim yeah, Bob. and Bob, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It suits them as well. It perfectly suits them. Yeah. But yeah, they're great anyway. Uh -huh. um, and those were designed and built by none other than Steve Norrington, who would go on to direct Blade. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he made those little devils. <laughs> okay. Well, that only that's fitting, right? <laughs> yeah. 
One of my favourite things in the show is the music, which was by uh, multi-award winning Rachel Portman. She composed the scores for every single one of them. Um, She won an award for them, later became the first female composer to win an Oscar in the Best Original Musical or Comedy Score category in 96 for Emma Mm -hmm. and was also nominated for the the Cider House Rules. Her music, I'm very pleased to say, was finally released on CD by Verez Sarabande uh, a few years ago and it is an absolutely beautiful three-disc set with all of the music on there. And even nice touches like you've got the opening titles with John Hurt's narration or without, so you can listen to both. But it's it's a stunning set. And if you can find it, I would definitely recommend you get hold of it. Very nice. It's lovely. Um, the show itself did not have a great history, unfortunately. It was it was aired, um, the, the Hands My Hedgehog, the first episode, which... Uh, Henson paid for himself out of his own money that aired on NBC and it won a primetime Emmy Award so they ordered a whole series three episodes were aired as standalone specials in late 87 early 88 Um, but then they decided to jam the rest of them as a segment in something called the Jim Henson Hour that was like a variety format in the same vein as the Walt Disney Hour and they stuck it in a weird time slot on a Friday, and it really didn't do well. It premiered in April in 1989 and died on its backside, unfortunately. So I think the 12th episode was never aired. So the episode, The Three Ravens, was not seen in the US until HBO broadcast the whole series again in 1997. So Wow. It did not do well. In the UK, it was broadcast on Channel 4 as a standalone series uh, of 20, 25-minute episodes with one advert break in the middle at a cliffhanger point that was designed. So, And I remember it. I remember it very fondly, and particularly because it was so sumptuous and so rich, but also so dark and so creepy in places which I really liked. There was a spin-off which was called um, Greek Myths, which replaced John Hurt with Michael Gambon. Um, They were halfway through another eight-episode series. They shot four episodes and then they were cancelled. They couldn't find a buyer for it. So, yeah, it didn't even get finished. But again, it looks like the character design in that was amazing. I'm not sure if that aired in the the UK. I've never seen it. and it's it's such a shame because it's a lovingly and beautifully produced show that I have very fond memories of. And Henson himself said, quote, I think they're the best television shows ever made. And he said that shortly before he passed in 1990. Wow. So, yeah. Well, it is it it is a really interesting show. And I, I feel like, you know, as someone who doesn't love puppets and Muppets and things like that, it was a little bit of a hard sell for me at first, but uh, I do really love the tone and mm. the way, like you were saying, that they cut back in and out of the storyteller. That's something that does not happen in fairy tale theater at all. Like she introduces the story and then it's just the movie as the that particular director sees it. Whereas this feels a little bit more woven in, you know, as an integrated thing it does yeah and the tone of it is slightly different as well it it is very much more filmic and serious there certainly isn't any humor in it that's shooting over the top of children's heads it's more of Henson's usual style of making it funny for everyone anyway that it's it's just delightful in and of itself and fairy tale theater feels more like the British tradition of pantomime which you probably Mm. don't have in the states I don't think so. No. no. I mean not but, not whatever. I mean we've I've heard of the word pantomime but not as like a thing. Like what I yeah. think we're talking about. Yeah, so they're traditionally at Christmas they are very silly plays for kids. There's mm. a lot of audi- audience participation which is unusual for Brit. Um <laughs> where and and you will you will get, you know, comedians and and celebrities cross-dressing as the the ugly stepsisters and that kind of thing and it's very much a family entertainment with a lot of 
uh, shouting at people on stage like um you know he's behind you and all that kind of thing so <laughs> right yeah and um, it feels fairy tale theater feels like that to me feels very knowing very funny and the sort of the sets and the lighting are very sort of video sort of absolutely yeah yeah low budget sort of thing yeah i think um they do some interesting things with their limited scope so they'll take actual drawings for example of like the castle that's drawn in some traditional fairy tale story book mm. and like a lot of a lot of times you'll get like illustrations in those of course and you get like like this beautiful castle and they will like paint that onto a huge canvas and it will be the backdrop and it's very obvious okay that they're on a sound stage and it's a yeah. canvas with like a little makeshift building it's almost like you're watching like one step above our town if you've ever seen like a play of our town where there's like no sets this is like there are very rudimentary sets a lot of times um but it's very obvious that they're not on location as opposed to in the storyteller like like you were saying you guys do all like you have castles that you could just go to and film <laughs> you know we don't have that really like we have a few ca castles but they're not really castles <laughs> no <laughs> no that's fair so, enough yeah uh so speaking of that i think what's interesting is to sort of compare and contrast the two shows um the fairy tale theater episodes are like they're an hour long or so they they, they vary but they're about 45 minutes to an hour whereas the storyteller is usually about a little under 30 minutes right it is yeah which brian henson said that he thought that they were too short and he wishes they'd been an hour i think i think he's wrong i well i disagree i <laughs> the, uh, having watched quite a few fairy tale theater episodes it feels like they're really stretching things sometimes there's a lot of material yeah. in there but there's also a lot of repetition and just prevarication over something very simple yeah, I think the sweet spot might be like 35 to 40 minutes, which doesn't yeah. work well for like ad time. Like mm. you either have a 30 minute slot or an hour slot typically. And so I don't really know the answer to that, but it does feel like they need to be a little longer than the storyteller, but not as long as fairy tale theater because then it's bloated. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think there is a sweet spot in there that's around 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go for it. Um, well, they both have this host uh, who introduces the story um, and is occasionally in the story. Um, I think we have like Shelley Duvall is in a number of, like around seven to eight different ones of these obviously she's in rapunzel like i just showed a few minutes ago um she's in several different ones actually and uh john hurt is in it at just the one right like he and it's an interesting it's one of the only ones that i i don't know of like exactly what story they're referring back to like all of the other ones i can go back and read the original fairy tale but this one not so much so this one is called a story short right it is yeah and it's i guess it's nice that he gets an episode that he's actually in um, i don't know whether that was something that he was particularly keen on but um it's not my favorite of the bunch it's not the strongest episode i don't think whereas shelley's ones actually are pretty good yes she's in rapunzel um but she's also in uh what's the one with the rumpelstiltskin mm. which is quite funny as well like in terms yeah. of, i enjoy the ones that have a little bit of comedy in there uh yes yeah yeah and rapunzel's hilarious uh, well, rapunzel is not... hilarious Sleeping beauty is the other one that is surprisingly funny christopher reeve you don't get to see christopher <laughs> reeve do comedy very often in his career sadly but he's very good at it he is he's hilarious <laughs> because he's so handsome and so striking especially when he's standing next to a normal person <laughs> and then they they just do all of these fun things with him where he first appears like you know they act like he is he's pretending to be the squire to a prince but it's actually they're 
pretending they've swapped whatever. And so the, the storyteller guy is like, oh, he's, um, you know, you have a very handsome prince who was the most handsome man in the land. And there's this random guy that comes in and then and his much less handsome squire. And there comes Christopher Reeve. And you're just like, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> All six foot four gorgeousness. Oh, of my him. God, he is so stunning. Like, you just don't even understand how cute he is until you you see him as like next to a regular looking person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's no surprise um, I, he was cast as Superman, really. I know, I know. Uh, the tone is super different between the two shows. We've already kind of talked about that. Um, but also the... Um, and, and you have, like, we have a sort of a, sl a slide of... <laughs> <laughs> so we have um, here, we, we've already talked about the Screaming Radish uh, we have Jeff Goldblum here as the big bad wolf in the Three Little Pigs, and he's sort of a sympathetic character. Like his wife is like this kind of nagging, horrible wife who's making him bring home pigs for dinner because they're having dinner guests, and he's like, I don't want to. So he's like kind of beleaguered, and like he's just like, I don't want to have to do this. And so he's like going around trying to kill these pigs because he's like, Look, I just need to get home and get my wife what she wants. Uh, <laughs> And he's so perfectly cast. And then Jeff Bridges here at the end of Rapunzel, the original the original story of Rapunzel, of course, being that uh, the girl gets left away in the tower and the prince is climbing up her hair every night and they're, you know, having relations. Okay, this is the original story. Oh, my. And uh, <laughs> gets pregnant from that. And then that's why the witch gets so mad, the witch who's got her, you know, because she's suddenly showing that she's pregnant. And so she she banishes Rapunzel, who is pregnant with twins, out to a desert. And she knocks the prince out of, out of the window and he falls and briars go into his eyes and blind him. And he ends up in the desert and her tears falling onto... She, he magically finds her and her tears falling onto his face make him so he can see again. But here you can see the, the, the fake blood which was what they had available to them, CGI effects of like 1982 or three, uh, <laughs> blood running out of his eyes. And it's it looks every bit as bad in, in the, the movie as it does here on the screen. <laughs> and then it's that horrific disturbing. thing. Disturbing. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not as disturbing, I don't think, as that thing that you've got on the right-hand side, which looks like Smeagol on crack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good call, actually. <laughs> Um, so that is how Henson and Co. decided to represent death in The Soldier and Death, this sort of, I don't know, semi-childlike goblin figure with enormous eyes, cold blue eyes. And you would see this figure by looking at a person who's sort of uh, at death's door, ill in bed. And you would hold this glass up and look through it and you would see this figure hovering over them. And if it was at the foot of the bed, they'd get better. But if it was at the head of the bed, they would die. The concept of it was just creepy as hell. The look of it was just pure, pure nightmare fuel. And I've never forgotten its, its cold, glassy stare. <laughs> Um, yeah. I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying. Yeah, but the creature design is just second to none in the whole show. <laughs> it's weird because he's kind of cute also. Yes, I think that's the thing. He's in the uncanny valley, valley between the two. Yeah, but, it's... But mostly just terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, and then we also, let's see the tone oh yeah so the tone spooky uh the film techniques vary on fairy tale theater because of course you have all these different directors coming in but uh the storyteller is a lot more consistent including what i just noticed maybe halfway through the first episode it really just s smacked me in the face which was a heavy use of dutch angles uh i mean it is like I feel like I'm watching um, Battlefield Earth, which also <laughs> is super in love with Dutch angles. You're just like I feel like I need to turn my head this way to watch the movie. Like, <laughs> so what is the what is the rationale for that? Like, 
Well, it's again, it's Steve Barron that really defined the visual style of the show. And he said in an interview that when he first arrived on set on the first day before the first shot, he put a piece of gaffer tape over the leveling head on the tripod for the camera and just declared everything should be off kilter and mad. And it is just there is yeah. a level shot in the entire show. <laughs> It's it is somewhat unsettling, like especially when you're you become very aware of it being there. Like you're just like, and it's always at the same angle. So like you're saying, it's not like constantly to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. It's not that. <laughs> it's just like always the same. So I guess that's that's to your point with the the tape. Yeah. Um, the artwork, yeah, I think you mentioned it earlier. The artwork uh, from Fairy Tale Theater is just stunning. Like, and I didn't really know this, but I came across it in researching it. They created all of this VHS box art. Uh, they would they released these uh, Fairy Tale Theaters on uh, CBS like home video, um, and it is stunningly beautiful. It's like got this Art Deco kind of look. Um, mm. I, I just, I would hang those in my house like honestly they're just gorgeous um yeah they're really stunning and and they even use them on the laser discs as well which i stumbled upon when i was researching for this um there there are a lot of them on ebay and i was so tempted to buy them i do actually have a working laser disc player uh -huh. and i was so tempted to buy them just because of the 12 inch cover art which is stunningly beautiful it, really it's amazing. really well done like i yeah. love the style of it and i also love the borders that art deco mm. border is just beautiful yeah yeah i want laser disc to come back just like vinyl <laughs> <laughs> me too uh, although don't tell michael that because he just got rid of a bunch of his like fears back when i when we moved into this house because he has he still has a lot of them but he had a huge number of them and they're extremely heavy when you have a giant box full of them <laughs> they are yeah yeah yep. putting up slide uh, shelves for them <laughs> you have to be very careful for sure for <laughs> yeah. sure the um the puppets are the thing in your storyteller show though right like and and yeah. i i see some i see some skexy type influence there on the creature on the left uh dark crystal yeah. There is, there's an enormous like dragon figure in one of the episodes or it's like a griffin or something. And it's huge as well. It's, you know, even bigger than the Skeksis and, and way bigger than Big Bird. It's just this enormous thing that's so well articulated. Mm -hmm. And then a very realistic lion looking character and this freaky man stroke hedgehog character. Um, yeah, it's all beautiful, beautiful work from that era of, of Henson's uh, sort of gothic dark storytelling stuff mm -hmm. so yeah definitely the star of the show i would say and and that haunts my hedgehog um story is so bizarre yeah i i had never to to the point about henson's daughter choosing these these stories because they were less lesser known they really are and i mean i thought i knew a pretty good amount. Of course, I've learned a huge amount that I didn't know this month in, in doing a deep dive on this, but that is definitely a weird story of like a woman who, a couple who wanted a baby and they said they would take any baby of any, any type and, and their baby turns out to be a human hedgehog combo platter. <laughs> it's like, who came up with this as a story that... <laughs> why what why and why does he play the bagpipes and i just i don't why understand not? i don't understand i still don't understand it's a no, very he, weird story <laughs> unlike many fairy tales it features a transformation which is quite freaky as well because he's like shaking violently and bits of his hedgehogginess are sort of flying off him and he ends up sort of i don't know half naked I, it's 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 a strange one. It's very strange. <laughs> it it definitely is, um, and and so one of the other ones that is a little bit of a strange choice in my opinion is the 
only one of these stories that overlaps between the two shows. So there was only one fairy tale that both of these shows actually covered. And it was a story I had never heard before called, well, it has a lot of different names in, in like historically, but it's, uh, it's called something akin to the boy who left home to find out about the shivers or the boy who left home to find fear. Mm. It's essentially a story of a boy who doesn't feel fear. He doesn't understand what everyone's talking about when they talk about being afraid of things. And he wants to experience this feeling for himself. So he sets off from home to discover fear and then has like a series of adventures in doing so. And, and so fairy tale theaters version features Christopher Lee and Vincent Price, who is just the narrator. Uh, frequently they will have some famous voice actor type person as the narrator uh, in fairy tale theater. Um, and this, I think you, you pointed out that, well, you can say this part. This is interesting. I did not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of the very rare occasions when you get both of these sort of iconic figures from horror uh -huh. uh, sharing on screen credit for the same production. There are only a four other examples I could find for a fiction narrative, which was um, House of the Long Shadows in '83, Scream and Scream Again in 1970, and The Oblong Box 1969. So this is one of four. Mm -hmm. as far as I can tell. But I may have missed some others. But yeah, still, it feels like a rare thing to get both of them involved in the same production. Yeah, and it it's... I, I do love seeing Christopher Lee in this, although I have to say, and I don't know if I'm going to... if you'll disagree with me, but I'm not in love with this story. I don't no. understand why it was chosen. Because I feel like, you know... One of the this is what the, I my brain goes to, okay, is like a person who doesn't feel fear is either profoundly mentally like not very smart <laughs> or alternately they're like a sociopath or a psychopath. So yeah. he could be one or both of those things. And so it's a it's a hard sell like his character is sort of portrayed as not being very bright at least in the fairy tale theater version um he it, it's it's played his character is played by peter mcnichol uh just three years after his dragon slayer uh appearance in 1981 um which yes. you, you point out <laughs> Yes, for, for which he has the proud honor of providing the first ever full frontal male nudity in a Disney movie. <laughs> I would notice that. <laughs> and also the best soundtrack of any movie that's ever been made. Right, Conrad? Oh, yeah. Love that soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mike just... pointed out that it's out like on, is it Criterion put it out? Some, somebody awesome put it out. Yeah, it's it's been put out as a special remastered edition. To me, it sounds like an orchestra falling down some stairs, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, opinions opinions may differ. Um, for for the storyteller, the lead character is played um, more sort of amiable. I mean, he still comes across as a simpleton, but it's more like. He's just in love with the world and just happy to see everything. So even things that are scary, he's like, oh, aren't you great? You know, he's just just seems to be really excited. And he's played by none other than Reese Dinsdale, who we saw in our last episode in the, the lovely British film Threads. Wow. Uh, so The yarns and threads just keep winding together. <laughs> Don't they just and and with a shocking mop of hair as well and talking about yarns and threads, yeah, um, that's yeah. some wig. But wow, yeah, Reese Dinsdale, um, and he sucks <laughs> in both, which is great. <laughs> Not as an actor, but as a character. As a character, yeah, he, yeah, he he really does. <laughs> <laughs> Although the way they treat the stories is is slightly different. I mean, there are common threads, like you say, the basic <laughs> narrative thread threads, of the. Conrad? Yeah, the fearless child uh, who's who's sent out to experience fear. And both of them end up going on this sort of um, house on Haunted Hill challenge where mm -hmm. they have to stay inside this castle in order to win some sort of prize in 
in fairy tale theatre, I think it's to inherit the whole castle. Whereas I think in Fear Not, he just discovers there's a whole bunch of treasure in there that nobody would found before because they were too scared to go in there. But there is a crucial difference in the sort of moral of the story or the ending of the story. Um, in Storyteller, Fear Not learns the meaning of fear for the first time. Nothing has bothered him, but he finally learns fear when he returns to find his true love at death's door. And he's overcome with fear and becomes very incredibly sad. And he's a really touching moment, I mm -hmm. think. Yes. And that's the way it resolves. And his true love comes back to life because of his tears and they live happily ever after and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Whereas in fairy tale theatre, it's a bit different, isn't it, Melinda? It is. <laughs> well, of course, they're going to go for the comedy. And they're basically, he he gets, he meets the lady that he's going to, get with and when she start, starts talking about getting married and having children he's like suddenly a commitment phobe and so that's what he's afraid of uh is get married oh, no, oh. having children yeah oh no like and then he's scared and it's like womp womp like it's just yeah <laughs> um i did want to point out that you know in the Grimm's story which the Grimm's made a ton of different editions of their children's and or yeah, children's and household tales. Um, and that's the book that's their anthology of all these stories, uh, these stories. And there, there's a ton of stories in there. Like it's probably the biggest collection, which is one of one of the several reasons why they're so no notorious for these, these types of stories. And that story is not in the edition that I have, which is which is this one here, um, uh, Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales, mm. um, which is delightful. It has a lot of great stuff in there, including some illustrations, but not that story. I was able to find it online to read. These stories tend to be not very long, so I read through it. And the biggest thing I notice is that... Um, after the he gets married to the girl, of course he gets the girl as the prize. He's still complaining. If I could only shudder, he says to, and it annoyed his wife a lot. And so she decides she's going to cure him of that. And she gets this big bucket of cold water that's even got fish in it, and like waits till he's asleep and throws it on him like a cold water challenge. Oh. <laughs> and as he wakes up shuddering, he's like. Oh, I finally learned to shudder, but he actually doesn't, he still doesn't actually know what fear is. I mean, he had the physical shivering reaction, which is not really what I think he's meaning when he says shudder. But nonetheless, he never actually learns to shudder in the original fairy tale. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, speaking of bodies of water, in, in <laughs> Storyteller, he also faces a monster in a lake, one of the creatures the creature designs that I showed earlier um, and uh, he quells it with violin playing and sends it off to Ireland <laughs> I don't know which that's not in the original story either where do you think that was it just an excuse to like they have this weird trippy scene of these like sort of mermaid type characters who are like swimming in the water that he's looking at which are supposed to be scary and he's not scared by them. And then this monster comes up who is their father, I guess. And he's like this weird monster thing that like, but it's not, it's nowhere in the original story that I can see. No, no. I think it's either something they've invented or they've incorporated from another tale or, or just other traditions. But, and I also think it's trying to avoid the repetition that you get in the a fairy tale mm -hmm. theater where he he doesn't go to the castle for one night he has to go for three nights in a row which although it it sticks with the fairy tale tradition of three is a magic number yes um it is a bit boring after a while it's like, oh yeah, it's this again <laughs> yeah there's a lot of the rule of three thing in fairy tales and it's great for children but you know like Okay, one rule of three in a story is probably enough for an adult, yeah, I think. Um, I think so. <laughs> so, yeah. So we, the two of us, like, I think I can speak for you on this, Conrad. We both got a little bit obsessed with this um, scholar. This And it, and don't 
worry, audience, like we're not going to go too hard into academics, but there's this woman named Maria Tatar. And <sighs> she is just the best. I, you guys, I cannot, ex I cannot stress enough how amazing she is. Like I have fallen completely in love with her. She's written a ton of books. Uh, I have a, a smattering of them here and, and I actually have them here as well. Um, Conrad, one of these is the one you had, which is the classic fairy tales that are annotated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I have uh, the hard facts uh, of the Grimm's fairy tales, which this is a really interesting book. And then the annotated Brothers Grimm, which is this big honking book, but is really amazing. It's a big, thick book. Um, and I can't wait to go through it uh, and really learn about all of that stuff. But Maria also appears on a number of podcasts, uh, including there's one called Grim Reading, which I highly recommend. They go through a lot of the Grim fairy tales, um, but she appears as a guest and she's just so fascinating and also very relatable, even though she is a uh, an academic uh, whose expertise lies in children's literature, German literature and folklore. And she's a professor of Germanic languages and literature uh, at Harvard University. And she also has like uh, degree, uh, she's the chair of the committees on degrees in folklore and mythology. So she really, really, really knows her stuff, but she doesn't like talk over your head at all. She's just so interesting and makes it really tie into all these things. And she's, it's, I love hearing her talk about it because she'll even relate fairy tales, get ready for this to things like the Kardashians where she talks yeah. about like <laughs> how fairy tales inform all of our media and she she watches a ton of like pop culture shows, like even the really current ones, like um, I think there's one called Grimm. Am I right? And mm. it's called like Once or Once Upon a Time or something like that. That's on. Yeah. I don't watch it, but yeah, she does, and she she finds these. I mean, there there are only a certain number of uh, stories in the world, as we all know, and she still finds these fairy tale tropes in all kinds of different storytelling that's happening now. So yeah, she'll relate it to the Kardashians and she'll relate it to how we think about our lives as well. So she's just this amazing, amazing woman who's able to uh, to explain very complicated things in a really accessible and warm way that doesn't yes. make you feel stupid. Yes. So yeah, in researching this, I got completely addicted to just listening to her voice and reading her annotations because... <laughs> She's great. She is. She's so great. Um, she talks about how fairy tales are mutable, which means changeable. Um, and they continue to exist because they adapt and change to their environment, which makes them distinct from myths, which are more set in stone. Um, and and she gives this interesting uh, graphic in, in her book. So she has this grid where at the top it's sort of like a, a big plus sign with a circle right in the center part and the circle represents the Grimm brothers nursery and house nursery and household tales is the name of their book sorry not children I said it wrong earlier um, but up at the top you have a naturalistic setting and at the bottom you have a supernaturalistic setting you have folklore on one side and literature so one being oral and one being written and then mm -hmm. you have these four quadrants all the way around so you have oral folk tales oral fairy tales versus literary folk tales and literary fairy tales so they kind of combine all of those into one big pot of porridge <laughs> there in the <Yes>. center <laughs> um, and, and it's sort of it's nice because it's sort of a nice grouping of different types of stories mm -hmm. um they they she talks about how these stories don't have like there's no canon in fairy tales right like so there's no original version that we for the most part are aware of with the exception of things like Hans Christian Andersen, when we know it was a written story with the first publication date. Um, but these stories are really popular because we impose our meaning onto them uh, and the, and only the bare structure survives. Uh, so they're, they're sort of things that are fundamental parts of human relationships, but we can modernize them. We can make them current and accurate to our own cultures which makes them timeless. Mm. Um, 
the other thing that she points out is a lot of the stuff that the Grimm's actually did. So Willem Grimm, Wilhelm, uh, he loved changing moms to stepmoms. Like it was one of <laughs> passions in life. And <laughs> I wonder uh, why though. <laughs> well, because it was perceived like the, their first iteration of that book, their first edition got a ton of criticism. And I, I was reading in her book how she was talking about a lot of people during this time period were writing anthologies of collected stories uh, at, like in Europe. And mm. it prefaces the beginning parts of these books. They would all kind of take an opportunity to have like snarky banter about other people who did the same thing. So it's kind of like rapper drama or like <laughs> YouTube drama. Like they would have like a whole thing where like the, there was another guy with the last name Grimm and the Grimm brothers hated him and he hated them. And so they were like constantly talking about why this other guy sucks in the prep of their own book. This book is amazing. Don't even bother reading that other hacks work because he sucks. Like <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, but so they got a lot of flack for the original versions. Most of these stories were the mothers, like Hansel and Gretel, for example. Both of the parents were like totally down to like take their kids out in the woods and get rid of them because they were literally starving to death. Right. Uh, but that didn't go over well. They were like, that is horrific. You cannot say that to children. So he changed it to the evil stepmother. Same with uh, Snow White. That was originally her mother. And he was, people were like, that, no, that's not okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, the Grimm's also added attributions to a lot of characters to emphasize their fitting nicely into German society. They're very German. A lot of these moral, the morality of a lot of this comes from the German uh, aesthetic. So women were firmly established in their place. Like, so instead of just saying there was a woman who lived in a house, they would say there was a chaste and pure woman who lived in the house, or there was a, a an evil stepmother. Like they would put that adjective on there at the very beginning so that you knew how you were supposed to feel instead of just letting it organically flow from the story. Right. Okay. Um, there's this thing that Maria talks about, which is um, monogenesis versus polygenesis. Now, this sounds fancy, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And it's really interesting to consider. So the question is, all these cultures and societies throughout the history of the world have like versions of the same story, things like Little Red Riding Hood. We see Little Red Riding Hood and, and um, Cinderella in China and the Middle East in, you know, Ireland, like all these different places. Now they're slightly different. They aren't, they don't have the exact same names, but the beats of the story are all the same, you know? Yeah. And why is that? Is it because they all came from one source? Like there was an original version of that story that then traveled on boats and got told around and just sort of changed as it moved? Or did a lot of cultures spontaneously come up with the same story themselves at different times and places? Yeah. And that's a thing that like anthropologists and sociologists argue about constantly, not just about fairy tales, but about culture, like concepts like marriage being in culture and things in religion. And they all have things in common, but there are cultures that never have any history of ever communicating with each other. So how could they possibly have the same systems in place? So it's a really interesting idea. And um, she makes that very easy to understand and intriguing to consider. What do you think yeah. about that, Conrad? Yeah, I, what, the thing I find fascinating is her being asked, as she is in several interviews, you know, which one she ascribes to. And uh, she's she doesn't sort of come down hard on one or the other. And neither do I. I kind of I like the notion that the stories speak to something that is innately human, that in some way that it relates so much to how we understand our lives and think about our lives mm -hmm. as creatures who tell stories and think about our past, our present and our future, that these versions of these stories would occur naturally everywhere. Um, but then part of me thinks that it would be fun to find out that there's one Uber story somewhere, the OG. So I don't know. <laughs> I think I find... I, f I find one more attractive and one more likely. So 
I can't tell. But I do think it's it's an easy to grasp thing that is quite profound, actually, the more you think about it. Yeah, it's something you can just kind of like noodle on as you're laying down going to sleep at night. Um, and, and lastly, I'll just say there's so much we, I could say about her work, but uh, I loved how she sort of described why the Grimm's were so successful um, and why we always think of them first, really, when we think of fairy tales. Um, she talks about them having the perfect last name. So they had perfect branding just right out of the gate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, they made a lot of these stories very short and compact, uh, which works really great for both children and adults. So you're reaching a larger target audience. They, they sort of tone down the stories. So you have that wide market, marketability and they gave it that additional violence to show how virtue is rewarded and vice is punished and we love to see that we love to see characters get their just rewards you know and i think of like when you and i did our collaboration on legend which very much feels like a fairy tale mm, and you have is. the american version versus the uk version the american version being shorter and having more violence so it's taking like the page out of the Grimm's, you know, whereas the British is a little bit more like um, Hans Christian Andersen or Perrault. I can't say his name. Sorry. Sorry, French people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Jack does not get the girl at the end of the director's cut, whereas he does at the end of the American cut. Exactly. Yes. Not that I'm, you know, promoting our great collaboration video that we did on that, but it, it does tie in perfectly with, with what we're talking about, I think. Although I do wish that we had done all this research and listened to <laughs> Tatar before we did the Legend video, but, you know, never mind. <laughs> I think so. It would have been really helpful. <laughs> it would have been. Um, it, I weirdly came up with, uh, in looking into this, I wanted to find just a, a, a really quick overview of some other shows that are similar to this that may have um, people may have heard of that are kind of in the same vein right so we have things like something i'd never heard of was shirley temple's storybook uh, which ran from 1958 to 1961 it was a, an american children's anthology series hosted by shirley temple and it was kind of the same setup where as fairy tale theater where she's sort of standing on a soundstage and she introduces the story and then it cuts to a filmic version of a, a reenactment of a fairy tale um and this is shirley temple when she looks like she's about 20 to 25 like she's very young but she's not a little kid anymore um right. then in the 80s of course we had beauty and the beast which is not like a hosted show but it is definitely fairy tale heavy like a modern one of the first i think modern interpretations of a fairy tale like that um and then you have things like the charmings that came out in 1987 uh, also the same year that beauty and the beast came out i vaguely remember this show um, it only had one season, not surprisingly, but it's this fantasy sitcom that has Snow White and Prince Charming that they were um, in, asleep for a thousand years and they wake up in modern Los Angeles suburbs and they have to <laughs> like live a regular life. But they have like, I don't know, they have like a regular family drama on ABC. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's just really weird. Um Grim Tales was something that came out in 89 to 91, a children's fairy tale story, uh, a children's television program based on fairy tales by the Brothers Grimm, um, with Rick Mayall as oh. a storyteller dressed in pajamas and a dressing gown. Um, oh, I don't remember that. He looks like Yahoo Serious to me. <laughs> is that? It, it is? It's the same kind of energy, actually. You're not far wrong. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, I also, of course, someone mentioned this earlier, Tales from the Crypt. I feel like while they aren't fairy tales, I think they're kind of almost dark, sinister versions of fairy tales, which is close to a lot of original fairy tales. And you have definitely got a host that is, hello, everyone, and no, 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 like he's sitting by the fire, much like the storyteller is, but he's just, you know, a skeleton corpse thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, I think these are delightful. And, of course, there are a ton of modern adaptations, like we mentioned earlier. But I think I think this is sort of a nice 
uh, grouping of these. And Conrad, you you did a great job this time of like pulling together our spreadsheets because I was just diving headlong into the data. So, uh, but you actually <laughs> put it on paper. So I did. Yeah, I think one of the ones that I looked at just out of interest was the number of film and TV adaptations of the stories and the clear winner by a country mile is Cinderella which uh, I don't know something about the rags to riches story and the sort of Pygmalion sort of story just seems to appeal to us um as a as a rom-com in Pretty Woman in all kinds of guises it just crops up everywhere yeah Maria always points out that any any story where you have a makeover is is on some level Cinderella. <laughs> so things like um, Clueless and Mean Girl. I don't know if Mean Girls is it, but Clueless. Those types of teen uh, rom romantic comedy type things. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm obviously Pinocchio is in there because everybody seems to be making five of those a year. Um, Certainly lately. <laughs> I know it's weird, isn't it? One of them won an Oscar. Although that is very, very good, Guillermo del Toro's film. But it's I just found it shocking that Pinocchio is number four as far as retellings is concerned because it's definitely one of the newer ones if you look at the estimated age of tales. Mm -hmm. So you have things like Jack and the Beanstalk being 5,000 years old as far as we can tell, Cinderella 2,000, Little Red Riding Hood, a mere slip of 1,000. But then you get to Pinocchio and it's only 140 years old. Yeah. Um, and that has a definitive version that was written and published by someone. So that's, yeah, quite an outlier. The only one of these that I did not read in advance of this uh, was The Gingerbread Man. Mm. Um, there is a another YouTube channel that I'm going to give some props to here. Uh, it's called... Uh, John Solo, so J O N Solo, sort of like Han Solo. I think it's a play on that. And he he does um, the very messed up origin series, and he basically goes through a lot of the different uh, versions of older stories. He sometimes he'll start with like if it has a Disney film, he'll do a quick run through of the Disney version and then compare it to like a lot of the original older versions. Um, and he does a great job of like synopsizing that if that's a word in like nine or ten minutes um but things like the little mermaid i obviously knew that was a book but i really didn't know that much about it and it is the most upsetting <laughs> so, <laughs> it's really a, i mean hans christian anderson has some dark stuff that he writes about but that story does not really have like the happiest of endings uh and disney makes a lot of changes and and i think that we talk a lot about when Maria will talk about this too, where the Disney versions of these movies have become the archetypes that most people, not just Americans anymore, but most people in the modern world know of these stories, but they are not really representative of the older, there aren't usually original versions, but like they're not representative of older versions. It's not to say that Disney is bad or wrong necessarily, but I would I would advise people and encourage people to like, if you like or are interested at all, like even a story that you don't think is that interesting. Like I've never seen the little mermaid Disney movie. No, me neither. But <laughs> I am in love with the original story. It is so interesting and so much more interesting than what I understand of the Disney version. So I'm just saying it's really really nice really cool to like delve into these things and like i could i could just sit here like i'm sad that we're going to be changing topics after this i'm actually <laughs> heartbroken that i can no longer sit and just read these and say i'm working like i'm doing my reading right now for dreamland like now i have to switch gears completely to a different topic yeah especially reading these uh the the annotated books there's nothing i like more than a book that's got footnotes that are longer than the actual text <laughs> i just I, I just love that i do too i do too uh, um yeah <laughs> so um now we're going to i guess we can um read some super chats now right are we at that part in the story I think we are, yes. Our story so, for today. 
<laughs> Indeed, yeah. So I think our first one came from Wicked Person. Fairy Tales in Viewmaster Discs. Hey, Future Dreamland, Viewmasters. Do you remember Viewmaster? <laughs> I do. I, I really did enjoy them. And But when I think about them now, I always think of, was it in Thunderdome that the kids were looking at the old, they had all of them and they kind of had them as their like history almost because they were pictures of things like. Yeah. It's very creepy and sad. Yeah. I do yeah. remember them though. I never had the good sets though. I always <laughs> had the ones that came with it. The, oh like, really yeah. Lame ones. <laughs> I had a couple. I just, I don't really remember what they were. I think that I had a few fairy tales though, for sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. And thanks for another super chat, wicked person. The fact that I'm teaching a room full of 15 year olds about fairy tales literally tomorrow morning for like the 10th year running makes this all quite odd. <laughs> <laughs> well, bring Maria Tatar into that conversation and you won't be sorry. I'm just saying. No, Maria Tatar improves every conversation. She I does. Mind. 100%. I want to be a part of her fan club. Yes. Um, Jason Anderson says, nude with Terry Gar sounds like a status update on Facebook these days. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, Jason also says, uh, and this is in response to this, the music that was playing during the radish scene that I played earlier. He says, wow, somebody gave the cat a bunch of crack and dropped it on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds accurate, yes. It does. <laughs> Kay Byrne says, when I was like six, I watched an adult film on Showtime. Everything went straight over my head. I just thought it was boring. I didn't get why they were bumping into each other until middle school. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the point, right? Is that you can have like, at the beginning of the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale theater, the king and the queen are like, you see the queen like looks like she's stripping behind a screen and the king is laying in bed saying, come to bed. I'm ready for you to be in bed. And she's like, okay, dear. She comes out, she gets in the bed and you think, wow, this is getting steamy. And then she pulls out a book. and She starts reading a fairy tale to him. <laughs> <laughs> and then at some point, this little gnome fairy thing pops out of a, a chest and says, you know what you need is a baby. That's what you want in your life. And she was like, a baby? How do we get one of those? And she says, well, you're going to have to postpone story time for tonight. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my God. Yeah. And then there's there's some whispering and some explaining. And they're like, and then, the king's like, okay, I'm willing to try this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he looks quite enthusiastic in the end. <laughs> yeah. Oh it's, my it's gosh. yeah, very, very sexually suggestive <laughs> yeah, very much theater. So. Like, just like the cucumber thing. It's like, okay. Uh, Jason Anderson says, replace the storyteller, but kept the creepy dog. That figures. Um, yeah. yeah. Jason says the dog's creepy. I mean, I think all the puppets are a little creepy, honestly, but I don't know if the dog See, is terrible. I creepy. think the dog's lovely. And because and, it's got Brian Henson's voice, it, it sounds like Hoggle from... It labyrinth does. i find hoggle to be way more distressing than the dog really <laughs> that thing yes. freaks me out really the bad. face is a bit odd the fun <laughs> thing about that anthony Mengella, um when he wrote the scripts he was writing dialogue for the dog and handed it into jim henson and jim henson just went huh so the dog talks and anthony Mengella just said well yeah muppets i just i just figured <laughs> 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 Why not? I like his character. He's kind of sassy and sarcastic. I like it. Yeah, and frightened of everything. It's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> Colt says, did anyone see that Alice in Wonderland two-parter TV broadcast back in the 80s? I remember really liking it. Um, I really want to do a full Dreamland on that in some capacity because I am obsessed with it. It is very, very, it's one of the most spot-on interpretations of Alice that's ever been made. In, in any kind of filmic way. Um, Who's in that? Everybody. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Telly Savalas is the Cheshire Cat and Scott Baio is in it and 
uh, Sammy Davis Jr. is the caterpillar and he gets up and he does a tap dance with Alice. And um, I mean, it's, it's an all-star cast. Carol Channing is the white queen and she is amazing. Like she's so great. Uh, she's wow. on par with Carol Kane in the Sleeping Beauty episode of Fairytale Theater. Who, I mean, she's perfect in that. But um, it's so, so good. And as somebody who is like obsessed with Alice in Wonderland, you know, you see the Disney movie and it's just not the story. It's there's so many changes. Don't get me started on the Red Queen is not the same as the Queen of Hearts. Don't even get me started. Um <laughs> But anyway, so yeah, uh, really, really good. And I would love to talk about it at some point. Uh, Portland 182 says the episode with the storyteller in it, a short story uh, or a story short is based on a Celtic folk folktale called Stone Soup. It says that like on Wikipedia. However, I can't actually find a copy of said story. Um, I know there is a folktale called S Stone Soup, which is sort of more of like a moralistic thing right conrad where it's like community needs to come together to create like if each person contributes we all get to eat it's sort of like yeah. almost like a fable more than a fairy tale um but the story in a story short is more about a guy being like a king's performer and he's almost like a scheherazade type character right yeah, exactly. He tells him a story I think every day for a year. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a um, fabrication to give John Hurt a role, to be honest. I think so, yeah. I think they just said it was a Celtic story, but I don't see any Celtic story like that. Uh, Jason Anderson says, Sam Raimi bursts in. Did somebody say Dutch angles? <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Um, Henson, never sleep again puppets. Yeah, uh, that's... Uh, that's exactly how I feel. Um, Zantara, thank you so much for the very kind super chat. She says, my eighth grade English teacher showed us fairy tale theaters Rip Van Winkle in 1992. Got to see the rest of the series over a decade later as my library still rented out the VHS tapes. I loved it. Favorite episode was Little Red Riding Hood. Yeah, that's, that, that is a good one. I generally love that story. Although what it's really about which I think we all know what it's about, but we don't ever like consciously think about that. It's kind of about assault and, and it kind of does some gross stuff in terms of like kind of blaming the victim, right? Like it's saying that if, if she hadn't gone off the path, then she wouldn't have gotten eaten. And in the original story, also I say original, an earlier version, there's a lot of like, like sex stuff in there. Like, much more specifically where like as little red riding hood is getting into the bed with the wolf he keeps telling her to take off her clothes and throw them in the fire because she won't be needing them anymore um and but what's really interesting about that story that older version is that little red riding hood once she gets in the bed with him she realizes something is wrong like she feels the fur and she's like this isn't right you know so she says i really need to go urinate i need to go outside and pee and he's like okay i guess that's fine but you have to wear this rope tied to your leg so i know you'll, you can't get away so she gets outside nude she ties the end of she unties herself from the rope and ties the rope to the tree and runs home and makes it home and escapes the uh would-be assailant so there's a lot of stuff in that you can unpack from all these different versions of Little Red Riding Hood. And there are a ton of them now where Little Red Riding Hood, much like what you said at the beginning of the show, Conrad, where she becomes like Maria says a trickster character or, you know, she pulls out a gun and she becomes the wolf herself. Like she becomes the powerful person in that dynamic. And I think that's an interesting take on all of that. Yeah, that's specifically taking down somebody who preys upon young, young girls in the movie Hard Candy, which is a very good... Yes, yes, she mentions that as well. Story. I haven't seen that. Have you seen it? I have, yes. We <laughs> almost, well, we tried to do an episode of Movie Oubliette on it, but it didn't work out. I see. Well, another, just a real quick side note, because I meant to mention this earlier, and it's worth checking out... Um, there's another version of Snow White that many of you may have heard of that is... Uh, by Neil Gaiman 
who also loves fairy tales and loves storytelling. And it's called Snow Glass Apples. It came out in, I believe, 94. Um, and it is sort of like Wicked is the story of the step, the wicked stepmother uh, in Snow White, but she's not wicked. And in this version, it's Snow White herself, who is like this vampire evil character. And she basically has everyone else fooled. And the stepmother's the only one who kind of sees through her. And it's very scary and creepy and like adult as many Neil Gaiman stories are, but it's fascinating to see all these different angles to look at these stories through. And it lets you learn even more about human dynamics. I just, I love seeing these stories through all these different lenses. It's just fascinating endlessly to me. Uh -huh. A couple more super chats we've had come in. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Chazilla. At the risk of adding more nightmare fuel to my life, where can I stream these shows? <laughs> um, so fairy tale theater, most of them are on YouTube right now. Um, that's the easiest and cheapest way. Uh, you can buy a DVD set, which I did. Uh, I found one on eBay, um, but it's just DVD quality. So, I mean, some of the ones that are uploaded on YouTube are a little, eh. Um, and then the storyteller, again, I, I found it on Shout Factory, um, which is, you can add it on your Amazon account in the US. I don't know, uh, in the UK, where that's a good um, it used to be on Amazon Prime for a while, but it's not anywhere at the moment, which is a real shame. Mm. So it's it's a case of um, get your DVD or on eBay or yeah. um, or just wait for somebody to pick it up again. I'm sure it'll show up somewhere again eventually. Yeah, yeah. And then um, the second uh, super chat we got is from action pop dad hi uh thank you so much for the super chat he says conrad mrs action pop dad has fallen in love with your voice and demands and requests books she's very taken by you. <laughs> <laughs> i agree i would love to to have conrad read a series of of books yes <laughs> i'm glad to do it <laughs> yes. yes well um I think that basically wraps up this episode of Dreamland. Uh, yeah. So you can find our show notes, which by the way, I'm very proud of this time. They are in APA style. So <laughs> please, <laughs> please go check out our beautiful five pages of show notes of all the articles I read, not all of which I got to, but uh, they're there. Um, those are at retroblasting.com slash dreamland. We will be back in April with our next show. Conrad, what is the title for our next show? The title for our next show is Stallion. Stallion? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that. Um, <laughs> until then, uh, you can follow me and Conrad on Retroblasting and Movie Ublia, respectively on all social media outlets and you can email us at the dreamland podcast at gmail.com thanks so much for listening goodbye bye <laughs>